actually mentioned in terms of uh, both centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges today numerous times. And I have to say, um, this is usually a very heated discussion, right? Because there are so many things to talk about, infrastructure, liquidity, right? So I will love to introduce our next panel, which is decentralized exchanges versus centralized exchanges. And we're going to discuss infrastructure and new trends. And this is a heated lineup, I have to say. Um, Nicola, this is your moderator uh, for the next panel, Nicola Stajano, Managing Director of MCC Capital. Nicola, we saw you on stage today already. So um, I'm going to let you introduce your amazing panelists. Guys, please come over on stage too. I think we'll let every panelist introduce themselves in the moment when you sit down. So, thanks. So, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be able to bring to you actually today this incredibly interesting panel about centralized exchanges versus decentralized exchanges. And I believe it would be quite fruitful if each one of you, as a girl, could uh, quickly introduce yourself to one percent. Who you are and what you're actually doing. Hello. Uh, keep it easy, please. We haven't started the conversation yet. I'm Yuguri, I'm founder of uh, Decentralized Exchange and Ms. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anton Bolob, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Market Maker from Switzerland. And in Switzerland, we like to be neutral, so that's why they put me in the middle between the centralized and the centralized exchange. So happy to speak about both. So. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Talal Khabar, I'm the co founder of CoinMina, a regulated exchange in Bahrain, and I'm also the co founder of Gibran, which is a company that builds centralized financial capital. Good afternoon, I'm Arab Ali from Yasmir Dan I'm taking out the uh, director of Global Key Account, uh, which I am in charge of the VIP and market makers on our centralized uh, crypto exchange. Hobby Global. And Hobby Global is one of the most subsidiary, important subsidiaries in Hobby Group. It's great to have you here, Katie. I've been a long time supporting you. Um, I think the easiest way how to start this panel off, the majority of the room probably is aware of what a centralized exchange is. But Gregory, if you can, like in a couple of words, just give a couple of cliff notes. What a decentralized exchange is and how it differs from a centralized one. Uh, the main differentiation that centralized in the centralized exchange somebody holds your money when you make a deposit. On this centralized exchange there is nobody somebody, there is only a smart contract. And when you uh, do the swap, it's automatically done on the blockchain and nobody holds your money, you own your money. Good, so we could actually go as far and say that the old saying your private key, your wallet, does it. Absolutely, you control, completely control everything uh, what you owe. Uh, the, the, the only thing that uh, the protocols you use, the decentralized exchange, needs to be audited. So there are no vulnerabilities there. So, so who, who actually is able to audit in today's time a decentralized exchange? When we look at AmiSwap, when we look at Uniswap, uh, when we look at Sushi and other infrastructures, who, who is capable to audit? take on such a challenge and actually audit the entire decentralized and take on also that risk because the liquidity which is being provided there, the coins that are being staked, the different wrappings, the bridges that are being built, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. yeah, there are three components there. First of all, is uh, there are some companies which are specialized on that. Um, the, the second one, the source code is open. So like all white or all uh, hackers, can do the audit and can uh, find the vulnerabilities and there is a back uh, programs. And the third one, uh, new generations of changes, they, more, they do kind of copy paste, so they take the uh, safe parts of the code and like replicate, replicate, add more functionality there. Okay. So all together it gives more or less 
uh, safe environment. Talal, you built everywhere. What are your thoughts on that? Why did you choose to go down the line that you went with the centralized rather than decentralized exchange? So, um, can I see a show of hands who here has actually used the decentralized exchange? And please say, okay, that's about 30. Congratulations, he's one of you just accepted that you own crypto, by the way. Great. So, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a, a short concept in a minute, and, and that's basically my rationale. So, whenever there's a new technology, there's something called technology infrastructure inversion. When the cars first came out, they used to drive on gravel road. And then they made them into proper asphalt. When the internet first came out, we used to use telephone lines to transmit the internet from one person to the other. And once the internet became important enough, now we switched to uh, fiber optics and created that type of infrastructure. So today, people use their bank accounts, IBANs, credit cards, and to do that, you need to work with a centralized exchange. 10 years down the line, Decentralized exchanges will be more popular than centralized exchanges. But we solve problems that are problems today because product market fit is a very important concept and you don't want to be building something that not many people will use. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you, which I was quite interested in, you, if I remember correctly, you set up shop in the UK, but you were regulated in Bahrain. How was the process there? Because I remember two and a half years ago, I was one of the first people that went to Bahrain and talked to the National Bank about blockchain and everything around that in the Tower of Innovation. I um, forgot the name, unfortunately. Bahrain Fintech Day. Exactly. And there I was welcomed, but the resonance was that people were not ready yet, there was still a lot of conflict, and it was still too risky in order to allow Bahrain to become a hub and to start providing regulatory licenses. The licensing process took us. 17 months. Congratulations. So you, you would have, like, a lot more than it takes to get a baby in this world. Um, but basically, those 17 months uh, included COVID. So, obviously, work and, and, let's say, licensed departments of banks and central banks weren't operating at capacity. But honestly, I have so much respect for the Central Bank of Bahrain because they put out a crypto framework that is very logical. And our rationale to be regulated in Bahrain is that. Today, for a centralized crypto exchange, you need banks to collaborate with you. And then, I previously had a regulated startup in an offshore jurisdiction, and whenever I go to any bank in the UAE, they would tell me, oh, I don't know this regulator, or I don't report to this regulator. So, our rationale of going with the central bank of Bahrain is that the banks in Bahrain can't tell us, like, they can't dispute our application because we both report the same entity, central okay. bank of Bahrain. Understood. I, before I get to Anton, I still have a very weird question for you. I mean, Huawei has been around for ages, and um, I've worked with a lot of your colleagues over the years, um, and we have gone through different cycles. Now, the question is the following. How do you see now evolving of decentralized exchanges when you're comparing centralized exchanges? You guys have a big user base, you're globally positioned and everything, but now decentralized exchanges are upping their numbers, providing incredibly big liquidity and becoming a serious competitor. So, yeah, as uh, working in centralized, uh, centralized exchanges, I don't think uh, there is a uh, um, yeah, it's a competitive relationship between the, uh, centralized and decentralized exchanges because they are two different types for many users. Different users will need different types of Trade trading mode to adapt their needs. Like someone choose um, trade on train for the decentralized exchanges, and someone like a uh, uh, custodian type. So, um, I, in my opinion, there will be coexist um, currently and in the near future. Okay, I'm talking. So I've been literally between both chairs. I mean, you work with centralized exchanges, with decentralized exchanges, and before I actually ask Gregory to answer to what Katie just said, what's, what's your current experience? Like, what functions better? What is easier to integrate? Where do you see the trends go to? How does, how does liquidity as a market maker function between taxes and sex? So, first of all, to speak on a neutral to say, actually, that if you look at centralized and decentralized exchanges, it is true, all the action is actually happening on centralization. And if you look at the volume numbers, 
still, I mean, Huobi is the second or the first largest exchange on the planet. That's where the action is and it's going to happen in the future. But now if we take a look what's going to happen, what happen in the future, then I have to turn to Greg. Because these centralized exchanges are the future, because that's where the innovation will happen. And, you know, speaking from a Swiss perspective, it's like, I respect regulation a lot, but regulation is very constraining. It tells you how you need to do things, and then you can onboard large amounts of clients and grow very fast. But then you cannot innovate a lot. You cannot be very free. So I think the freedom will actually happen in this central respect, where Greg is, but I will not, I don't want to say that you are going to be the winner tomorrow. It's going to be a long process. I'm a big believer in decentralization, like you are. We spoke about this before. So I think over time, just like you said, it will all become decentralized, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. So this is kind of from a high level perspective. Now, as somebody who uses all those exchanges, you know, as a market maker, as a professional trading company, centralized exchanges have their act together. They're professional, a lot better. I can actually call a support team, or my chief of trading can call the support team and get it from Kobe and Koimina, and we can solve problems. It doesn't still exist in a decentralized environment for many different reasons, but that's fine. We are going to progress and we're going to end up there. And kind of talking about liquidity, I think the big innovation of the decentralized world was actually crowdfunding liquidity. Because when you're a market maker, you have to have capital from somewhere, and it's usually professional or institutional investors. They give us capital to the market maker. But the decentralized exchanges or AMMs, automated market maker, what Greg is doing, they had this big vision and they were very clever and said, how, how about we crowdfund or crowdsource liquidity? And that's then how we market it. So I like both. We're Swiss, so we like to you know, play with everyone. But I'm kind of like a big believer and this is my that we all become decentralized. So. You mentioned a couple of times Greg's now in uh, combination with decentralized exchanges. Why did you build a bank? Out of everything you could have built, why, like, you woke up one day and you're like, oh, I'm building a DEX. What was the thought process behind it? Uh, actually, I have all this uh, was uh, thinking about uh, true DAO, uh, decentralization, and uh, decentralized ownership. And one day, there is one exchange, a centralized exchange, I will not mention the name, they misused my funds. So it was like a trigger that. It okay. has never happened in the history of exchanges. <laughs> yeah, that's what actually is a trigger which uh, uh, pushed me to, uh, to realize what I was dreaming about. Okay, very straightforward. Anton, you're sitting here in Dubai right now. You have been successful, you're working with multiple exchanges. What are your plans for the GCC area? Are you setting up? Have you set up? Oh, like, what has been the resonance you saw? So, I actually visited this first time in Dubai in 2016, 17, and kind of those were the early days, you probably remember if you even mentioned the word blockchain, kind of there was not a lot of receptive people. That has completely changed now. I'm talking about Dubai here, but also Bahrain. I think here we're talking about that as well. So, we are kind of from our perspective, because we're a regulated entity in Switzerland, we're kind of always not the first mover, not the first pioneer, but kind of when things become more established, we have regulated players like Coinina, then we kind of look for our opportunities, yeah. So I think now is the right time to go, go forward, and I think kind of certain jurisdictions for many different reasons are kind of holding back. I'm talking about Asian uh, jurisdictions where due to many regulatory changes, it's becoming a lot difficult to attract the end traders and the end users. And I think MENA is finding their place, so maybe this is something you can say how we see things work. I mean, um Centralized exchanges have a much better user experience, and that's not something that anyone can really dispute at this stage. Um, today, 2.5% of the world own or have used crypto. That is the same percentage of people that used the internet in 1998. So, technically speaking, centralized, decentralized, local, non-local, regulated, non-regulated, it shouldn't matter to us, because a rising tide lifts all ships. Everyone in this room, if they work in crypto and continue to work in crypto for the coming five years, it's going to be a net positive. That you, I didn't remember you were mentioned or not, is the, um, I'm sorry, forgot it. Let's go, let's go with the NFTs, <laughs> I think this is easier. I mean, like, I'm already questioning always how you value an NFT in general, but as they say, the value lies in the eye of the buyer. But have you guys had any experience with this recently, or? 
Have you guys had any experience with this right now yet or not? NFTs, you buy the trade one. Yeah, uh, personally I bought NFTs. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I mean, Gregory, you, Emiswell does so much more than being a text. If you guys provide liquidity, you're using NFTs also. Like, how has that been in a decentralized environment? Is it easy for people to connect with Rarible or OpenSea or anything else? What has been the experience with passing or trading and transacting NFTs to your platform? Uh, so we treat them a little bit different than uh, NFTs, like traditional NFTs, which uh, are. Traditional NFTs, okay. I mean, traditional NFTs, I mean, most of the NFTs, 99% that would be art NFTs, so like kind of uh, digitalized uh, piece of art. Uh, but also there are play NFTs, like, you know, like Infinity and other games, uh, play here, which is uh, based on NFTs as well. And we have utility NFTs. So this is a art NFT cards, but they give uh, extra benefits on the platform. You earn these cards, you need to do some actions on the exchange to do to get these cards. And of course we do these cards, uh, collections of these cards uh, with the collaborations with other projects. So it allows to other projects to uh, uh, introduce themselves to our ecosystem and uh, vice versa. So and once an NFT is received, then it gives benefits on the platform like uh, speed up mining or uh, getting more rewards from liquidity or other things. Is the NFT usually minted in the currency of any or the project that introduces it? Uh, if it is a, like NFTs on a blockchain, so oh, yeah. that, that could be an agreement with a, pro with a project or kind of mechanics that you would like to do. And actually, these NFTs can be moved to OpenSea, to Variable, or any other platform and uh, be sold there. Somebody wants to get more benefits on the platform, yeah. they can buy it there. Anton, how do you provide liquidity for something like this? So, uh, I was uh, just waiting for you to ask. So, NFTs have a very unique feature, is that they're actually unique. So, like, if you have a single painting, like, to imagine, it, like, how do you actually provide liquidity on both sides for a single painting? Like, it doesn't really work like that. So, market making, actually, or trading, if I can call it like that, in NFT space is very similar to how dealers or pawn shops operate. So it's like an entity that's always there to willing to buy, giving you a price and you should get a very steep discount towards you what you trade last time. And they are kind of very much operate like invent, quite big inventory holders. But in the traditional sense of market making for an NFT, you cannot provide a bid and you cannot provide an offer because it's a single unique as digital asset. So in that sense, this is something that from Floftech's perspective, we're very, very interesting very interested how to do, but having said that, you know, no solution at the moment because it's just a completely different, uh, you know, it, it's innovation, it's not something that you can package in the old model how the crypto works. I'm sorry that I have to drill a little bit deeper here, but if you look at fractional ownership, for example, how do you, how do you imagine this map if you have a, like one NFT which is distributed in a thousand pieces? And, and in there, you would be able to create a market yeah. or, or Yeah, that, that's a different story if you can fractionalize actually an NFT or if you actually trade a whole collection. So you put a collection together and then you say, let's create one single token out of that and then fractionalize it. So it's like trading large collections in the art, art world. That is feasible, that is possible. Now, when you take a look at the trading platforms, when the NFTs are traded, it's not operating like that. So you can buy a single NFT, sometimes you can do a whole collection, but you cannot really fractionalize out. We would like to have it described now. So, but maybe this is something we can discuss over at tea, you know, to dive more into. If it's fronted and crazy enough, we don't always get um, Guys, because I'm seeing that time is slowly running out and we're getting to an end, um, I, I believe everybody here is mostly interested where each one of you sees this competition, if we can call it like this, or this coexistence, actually, if I follow your lead here. Where is this going to go when you look into? the next 12 to 18 months, because I don't believe we can actually predict anything more than that. Maybe if you say, we don't, it's blockchain, it's crypto, we don't know how things react to 12 to 18 months, actually, on the bad time frame. Hello? <laughs> okay. Basically, you 
you said, uh, what do we predict for the 12 to 18 months? I don't think anyone can even predict what's going to happen by the end of the year, let alone 12 months. Uh, we are in a very fast growing industry that has so many moving variables. Um, but if I was going to pull something out of my head, um, I'd say that um, basically we, we've already seen one country adopt Bitcoin as a self-sovereign uh, method of, of, of money. I think we will see many other emerging markets do the same. Um, I think stable coins, we will see stable coins issued by governments as well. Um, and I do think that uh, in the coming quarter we'll see many companies follow Tesla's lead by adding Bitcoin as a uh, basically hedge against inflation on their balance sheet. And then final prediction is um, Ethereum 2.0 will be a huge success and it will basically be the go-to uh, smart contract blockchain um, with several others trying to follow its lead just like we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. um, actually my opinion is the same like to us. Huh? So, um, That's, that's all. <laughs> are you, uh, would you like, when we're looking at asking more questions here because that was quite interesting, are you, were you willing to actually then accept some kind of centralized, uh, like, or, like governmental bank, minted, coin, or on the exchange, or? I speak about myself and not about my company. I am not. Yeah, yourself, obviously. Yeah, myself and not the company. Maybe the company does something that's own best interest even if it goes against my opinion. But I personally think that government issue digital money is actually quite dystopic. Um, and I do think that the public sector is should not be in charge of money. I actually believe that in the coming 20 years we will see the separation of state and money, like we saw the separation of state and church, and at the risk of that being of somewhat of a controversial statement, I did qualify. Thank you very much, Phil. Anto. So I really think there's going to be a tug of war, quite a bit of difference in opinion how the blockchain technology is going to be utilized going forward. If you go to Europe, if you go to US, uh, the regulators really have a hard time, uh, the retail, in any way interacting with digital assets and cryptocurrencies. They're really afraid of that because of, they have experience in the financial markets that kind of usually the retail has a difficult time when markets obviously move down. But the other side, I think, you know, I think the most exciting jurisdiction country in the next 18 months is going to be China, despite what the government is saying. I think in the next 18 months they're going to roll out a full-on infrastructure on the blockchain. We're all going to be surprised how did that happen so fast, because I think that uh, there's a lot of talk happening out there, but I think every country, every person, and all of us here just see the immense potential that the blockchain technology can bring, and I would kind of go, hey, 18 months is a lot, so that's more like 18 years in the crypto world. So 18 months ahead, I would say, China is going to do amazing things, actually. Okay, Gregory, you have the last word. I think the firewall Bitcoin is just uh, decentralized uh, money, uh, uh, games on uh, blockchain, and play to earn. play to earn will be growing a lot. Um, so this is already separate role from the uh, government money. It will exist and grow. Uh, centralized exchanges will be try to catch up. They will be trying to integrate DeFi instruments into their web interfaces. Maybe integrate taxes into their interfaces because uh, finally they will be converted to decentralized exchanges. So what's your prediction, Nicola, please? I'm asking the questions to my friend, not you. The panelists are asking you, but I actually am. Honestly, for me, I believe that both parties are going to coexist because I do not believe that one can work without the other. So my effort has gone into providing support, help, and guidance to both sides because I think we're going towards the same goal. And I'd rather do this together with everyone and try to get separated. I think we can actually close it here, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Please you. Are all of the